Okay, everybody, you have made your feelings known loud and clear. I will do parts two, three, four, and five of my shelf run through, so let's keep going. Actually, it's kind of glad you guys really wanted to do this because originally today, I was actually going to be doing my filming of Francis Drake. See, I've got it all set up here. It was ready to go, but unfortunately, I'm still waiting to hear from the designer of the game about a couple of questions I have about the now official two-player variant, and I wanted to make sure I had them all straight in my head before I did the run through. So this was originally my plan today, but I didn't hear back from him, so hopefully I'll be filming that tomorrow. But for today, let's do part two. To this shelf, which I don't have a name for or anything like that, but let's just go on ahead and get, oh, get on down. So far to go. Okie doke, let's go. Let's start from here. Coliseum. Okay, I haven't actually played this game yet, I have to admit, from Queen Games. It's at, or I'm sorry, not Queen Games, Days of Wonder. These are uh, a couple of Days of Wonder games right here. And I don't really know much about it, except it's supposed to be a three-player game, at minimum, but it has a supposedly a really good variant that lets it be playable very and very fun with two. Um, and I, I think it has something to do, it's not really about you know, having big, epic, gladiatorial battles. It's about putting on these big, epic shows. You know, um, you know you've, you've often heard about how the Colosseum, you know, they would flood it, and they would, like, recreate biblical, you know, or not biblical scenes, but, all, you know, kind of really big battle scenes and whatnot. And so this is about you putting on a big pageantry, a big, gigantic show, and having to deal with, um, you know, all the props and actors and all that and trying to get the most acclaim. It's a very, very cool idea. So very, very different than what you would expect. It's just like some kind of gladiator-style thing. I'm looking forward to playing it someday, but I've never gotten around to it yet. But anyway, and like I said, it's out of print. It's kind of hard to get anyway, so eh. Tickets ride. I don't need to pull this out. Everybody knows what that is. You know, very, very enjoyable. Jen and I infinitely, of all the ticket rides we played, we still prefer the Europe map the best. Um, you know, both because we live in Europe and because we prefer the slightly less cutthroat nature of it because you can't get completely frozen out of a line you're willing, you're trying to go for. You just have to lose a few victory points if somebody tries to freeze you out. So, but you know, any version of it is absolutely fantastic. Oh, plus the other thing, the Europe map works fantastically with two, unlike the default USA maps, which are a, a bit too big and empty with only two players. But still, great game, absolutely love it. Um, although these days, pretty much the only time we ever played is when muggles come over to play because we've played it enough and we for us we generally want a little bit heavier fare but it is it certainly deserves its crown as the ultimate gateway game that you can get anybody playing ticket to ride okay cargo now this is another one from days of wonder and this one i think got very unfairly harshly beat up uh, a couple years ago when it came out because people expected it to be something other than what it is and they held that against it. What this game is is just a very sweet, simple, pure um, you know, very straightforward auction game where um, you know different you know, you're doing set collections kind of like raw. Um, and you know, trying to do auctions. There's nothing cool or fancy or special about it. It's really straightforward, but it's just really clean and elegant and fast playing. And I've got a split box there. Oh dear. Uh, elegant and fast playing, and we really enjoy it a lot. Um, you know, a great, great auction game, and it plays great with two. So I don't know why it got so beat up and so many people were, like, were down on it because, ah, I really expected this to be some big epic cargo noir and it's just a, 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 an auction game. And I say, yeah, so what's wrong with that? Don't hold against this game what you thought it was going to be. Judge it on what it is, which is a fun, quick, smooth, elegant gateway auction game. Okay, anyway. Tobago. This is one of Jen's absolute favorites. She loves this game. I've talked about this a few times, although I don't think I've ever done a run-through of it. It's actually a really, really cool reverse... Um, what do you call it? Re reverse deduction game where you're over time you are playing cards that um, tell you that a treasure might be next to a for is, is next to a forest and next to a river. And suddenly you know, oh, well, to be next to a forest and a river or a lake, it has to be right here because this is the only place on the map that this this one right here is the only place that's next to a forest and a river at the same time. And so, you know, players are com kind of almost cooperatively playing cards trying to determine the location of these treasures and then racing to get the treasures first. It's a really, really clever game. Um, very, very nice. Also, a really great gateway game. Uh, not to surprise, you know, hey, I guess coincidentally, here's four. I don't know about Coliseum, but here's a bunch of... Here's three really great gateway games. Okay, continuing on. Some CGE action. Dungeon Pets. Oh, we love this game so much. I did a run-through for it a while ago. 
absolutely excellent game. I think this was our number one game for either 2010 or 2011, whenever it came out. Wonderful, wonderful game. All about raising the, you know, you can see it's kind of happening here. Raising these cute, adorable fantasy creatures. Um, from babyhood up into adults, dealing with their needs, you know, feeding them, playing with them, cleaning up after them if they make a mess, and uh, trying to grow them so they grow up big and strong so you can um, sell them because basically you're running a dungeon pet store in this game. Absolutely wonderful. Hilarious, clever, deep, thinky, one of our absolute favorites, Dungeon Pets. Tolkien, the Mayan calendar. Uh, you know, this game everybody worried about, was it just gonna be a gimmick, the gears? This is the game with the big gigantic gears. I've done a run through for it as well, where um, as you put your workers down on these gears and you rotate, you rotate this big master thing, all the workers spin on these individual gears. And basically what that represents is when you set a worker to do something, the longer they stay on that gear, the more they rotate, and the, the, the greater the effect of what they do. So it's a worker placement game with a twist where time counts. You uh, don't just put your worker down, get the thing, and then go back. The longer they work, the more they do. Awesome game, really elegant. Cannot wait to try the expansion. Got the expansion over there, picked it up this year. Zulkin. Ah, Theseus. Just did a run through for this the other day. And if you hadn't seen it, Jen and I were blown away. Um, I don't think either of us particularly care, expected to enjoy this game. Be um, Well, mostly because I know Jen hates aliens and James Cameron, Space Marines and all that. And that's what this game is all about. But we were blown away because this is nothing like what we expected. This is a very, very heavy puzzle game, tactical puzzle game, where players are kind of using a Moncala style system to stay one step ahead of each other and just outwit each other. And even though there is conflict, it doesn't feel like conflict because you're not really punching each other in the face. You're just in a race to score the most points the fastest. Really, really great game. Really big surprise for us. We did not expect to like this. And in fact, it turns out we loved it. Okay, Legacy, another big game for this year. This one's very, very neat. Uh, the Testament of Duke de Crecci. I've done a run through for it also. In this game, basically, you are building a family tree over three generations. So you start out as this powerful patriarch or matriarch, and um, you know you get your kids married to somebody, and then your kids have kids, and then you have to worry about getting your grandkids married into the right family so you can get the right prestige and, and honor and money influx into your big family. And then you got to get your great grandkids married into the right family. And it's a big fancy card management game. Really, really clever. A lot of stuff. A lot of really funny storytelling that goes on in this game too. Okay, Sansuchi, I don't know much about this game other than it's from uh, Michael Kiesling of Kramer and Kiesling. He produces a lot of really great games and I know this is basically a tile laying game um, about building the great Sansuchi Gardens, apparently, or the Gardens of Sansuchi Palace or something like that. Don't know anything about it, but I suspect we'll enjoy it quite a bit. You'll be seeing a video for that. Oh, time is running out. I'd like to say I'm going to get this done by the end of the year, but I don't. It's probably not going to be until January. I've got so many games. I'm so backlogged. But it looks very pretty, and I know we're going to like the theme, which just remains to be seen whether we like the gameplay. Okay. And then the last one on this bottom shelf, Sea Land. This is a very, very neat game that a lot of people don't know about. Um, basically, it's. You can, you can see the board here. The board is gorgeous. It looks absolutely... The light's kind of dim in here. I don't know how well you can see this, but the board is absolutely lovely. It's basically set in Holland, and at the beginning of the game, the whole board is flooded. And what you're doing over the course of the game is you're um, placing dikes, and you're putting down windmills to basically start to drain out all the water so that you have land that you can claim. And, um, you know, because that's historically what happened here. That's what the, uh, they, the Dutch did in Holland. They basically reclaimed all this, this uh, swampy marshland and turned it into arable farmland where they grew tulips. And so that's what you end up doing. You can actually see the, like those threes. Those are uh, flower fields. And just really, I mean, a wonderful theme, really cool mechanics, a really, really unique game, and kind of an unsung gem that very few people seem to know about, but really great. We enjoy it a lot. Sealand. Okay, moving on. 10 minutes in. Wow, this is taking longer than I thought. Showing all these boxes slows things down. But anyway, okay. Cairo. Here's a bunch of Queen games. Back to back. Uh, Queen, Queen Central. Uh, you know, so which means they're all relatively light to medium weight, although variable. This is kind of a light to medium weight game. 
It is set in the market stalls of Cairo where players are actually, they've got this big grid and they are setting up market stalls of their color all over the place. And you can see those little figures. Those are customers. And what you try to do is you try to set up the market stalls in the right place to attract the customers to you and hopefully not attract them to your opponent. But over time, this grid becomes a maze of stalls and you have to be really smart about where you put your stalls to make the customers move in the right direction. Very, very clever game. Really interesting, really unique. Okay, Kingdom Builder. I just did a. I just talked about that in my top ten games of 2011. Neat game, a lot of fun. We like it a lot. It's from Donald X Vaccarino, the designer of. Dominion, and this is a game that pretty much has that same level of replayability, um, you know, variability that Dominion has because you put together a randomly generated board from lots and lots of different board pieces, and then every time you play, you get a different set of score-making objectives as you try to place your little markers out all over the board, um, following, you know, you know, well, basically following a very simple set of rules to try and hit whatever objectives are in this particular game. Really, really clever game, really clean, really elegant, like it a lot, Kingdom Builder. Fresco, oh, this is one of our favorites. Jen loves this game especially, and I think it's really great too. Really neat work replacement game that's a lot of stuff going on as players basically try to collect paints, you know, and sometimes mix paints to create different paints or just buy them at the market so that they can paint effectively the Sistine Chapel. Oh, it's not, it's something like the Sistine Chapel, which means like, you know, for that one right in the middle, to get four points, you need to have an orange cube and it looks like a green cube. So you have to collect the right paints. And, um, you know, so everybody's vying to get to the market first in the morning so they can get the paints they need. Really Really great game and a lot of variability because this game comes with a ton of modules so you can play it as a really simple light gateway game that would be on the same level as Ticket to Ride in terms of complexity or you can play it as a really nice medium weight Euro that's a lot of crunchiness and meatiness. We like it a lot. Ah, Escape, another one of our favorites. Uh, this, to, to this day, this is my most popular video. Uh, people absolutely love it. It's well worth watching because this is, I would say this is the closest that board games have come to capturing the frantic energy and excitement of a video game. Because what it happens in real time, players are running around you know, trying to escape this ancient Mayan temple before the whole place collapses. And so you play in real time, you have 10 minutes to play, and you're rolling dice as fast as you can to get the combinations of dice you need to escape. Uh, and it's cooperative, so everybody's working together. If somebody gets stuck, somebody else, they can say, ah, help me, and somebody else runs across the, the, you know, the dungeon to save them, but then you're running out of time. Uh, it comes with a soundtrack. You play on a CD or you know, play out through MP3, so there's a lot of atmosphere in the room. Absolutely fantastic. Love, love, love. Escape, Curse of the Temple. In fact, there's a sequel coming out um, next year, which is the same escape moniker, but it'll be escape from a zombie infested town. So that's actually really cool too. Really excited about that. Normally we don't care for zombies, but because it's uh, tied to this, we're gonna we're very excited for it. Castelli, haven't played this. I've had it for a while. Picked it up in a math trade. Don't know really anything about it. It's um. Oh, I can't really say anything about it. Maybe somebody else could talk about it for me. We'll get to it eventually. But like I said, haven't really um hasn't been really been a super. Um, high priority to do. Um, I know it is about um, claiming land and uh, laying tiles and stuff. I really couldn't say anything about it. Don't know much about it. Just looks pretty. Um, seems to get relatively reasonable reviews and I picked it up in a math trade. Okay. Lancaster I know about. I've done a run through for this. This is an awesome game. A worker placement game set in uh, jolly old England as you help Henry V um, you know, basically bring stability to the nation while also fighting the war in France. And the cool thing about it is it's a worker placement game where your, your workers have variable levels of strength and they can become stronger because your workers are knights. And if you send a worker off to a particular spot, it, you can replace somebody who's already there if your worker is more powerful than their worker. Really, really neat game. Oh, plus the other thing about it too, there's a lot of voting. Every round, there's a bunch of new laws of the land that will come into effect if players you know, cooperatively vote them in, or alternatively, they could vote to overturn those new laws, and you know, those laws affect who will score points. So there's a lot of politicking that goes on in this game too. Absolutely love it. Have played it with pretty much every player member. I used to play this a uh, fair bit uh, at a job I was at previously, where I'd play with a bunch of my coworkers at work. It's also a fairly quick game. Lancaster is fantastic. 
or Robin de Bois, I guess. Robin de Bois. I mean, it's basically, uh, in English, this is known as the uh, Merry Men of Sherwood, I think. Or, yeah, I think so. Robin Hood's Merry Men. I think it's Merry Men of Sherwood. And it's from Vlada Shavadal. You know, the same designer as uh, Dungeon Pets and Through the Ages. You know, very, very hot popular. And this is a game he did a long time ago. Oh, back, I don't know, in 2004, 2005, before he was really well known. And um, this is long out of print. It's... I don't know, I don't think it's particularly hard to find. It's language independent, so you could try to grab any language version you want. And it's a neat game. Jen and I were really surprised that it didn't really catch on more because the, the core mechanism of it is it's actually kind of a precursor to uh, dungeon pets, actually, because every turn you've got your band of merry men represented by these cards, and you secretly basically create a raiding party uh, by putting these cards in a certain order and deciding which of your merry men will go out and attack, you know, because obviously you want to rob the rich and give to the poor. And both players do that at the same time. And so you're trying to figure out, well, is Jen going to lead with Little John or is she going to lead with Friar Tuck? Is she even going to bring Man Marion? Because all these different characters have different abilities. And so once you've actually, once everybody's revealed what their raiding party is going to be. You find out who actually wins in the robbing of the rich, and then that gives you lots of special abilities like kind of area control, a ball of Sherwood Forest, and stuff like that. It's a really neat game, and I'm surprised more people don't talk about it. One thing that bugs us about it is, apparently, uh, well, the English rules and the French rules, and obviously it was originally pr published in France, have a completely different set of rules for how the game ends and how final scoring happens. And nobody really knows what Vlada really wanted because they're both so radically different. Um, and so that's something I really have to get to the bottom of someday because we really want to know what's the right way to play this game because between the English and French version, the rules changed fairly significantly. So that's kind of odd, but still, it's a neat game. A neat game of bluffing and trying to anticipate what your player's gonna, do, what your opponent's gonna do. Uh, Merry Men of Sherwood. Dark Horse. Awesome game. Awesome, awesome game. We like this one a lot. This is a dice rolling worker placement game crossed with a area, uh, Settlers of Catan style um, settling the Old West. And I recently did a run through for this because there is an expansion for it on Kickstarter right now. Um, I, it, actually, depending on when you see this, it might still be going. It's, I think as of this moment right now, I think it's running for another day. So maybe you can still get a chance and get in on the Kickstarter and get the expansion and the original game. But this game is absolutely awesome. Our favorite dice rolling worker placement game. We enjoy it more than Alien Frontiers. We enjoy it more than Kingsburg. Dark Horse, really thematic, a lot of fun, and the expansion makes it something that was a good game, an amazing game. Castaways, I just did a run through for this last week. Very, very neat storytelling game. Um, really, really clever how it does storytelling, kind of in the same vein of Tales of Arabian Nights and Agents of Smirch, but does it in a very, very different way with cards that we liked a lot. And, um, you know, really like the theme of, you know, trying to survive on a deserted island and working together to try to escape. Only problem, only problem we had with this game is it's a semi-cooperative adventure. And when Jen and I were playing, we did not want to play semi-cooperatively. We really wanted to play fully cooperatively. We did not secretly want to be trying to be um, worrying about who was really going to win. And so... For us, we ultimately didn't like it, but if we were willing to play semi-cooperative, I'm sure a lot of people do like that, a lot of groups might like it, we think it's actually an amazing game, but only if you're willing to play semi-cooperative. If you want to play fully cooperative, we don't think it really works that well as a fully cooperative game. Maybe someday the designer will release some official variant rules to turn it, because I believe it's here. I believe you with, a, with some rules tweaks, you could make this a good cooperative game, but that's not the designer and publisher chose. They want a semi-co-op game. So if that's what you're looking for, it's great. If you're not looking for semi-co-op, you might want to think twice. But um, still, the game itself, really, really good. Peleponies. Oh, this is our favorite auction game by far. Spoiler alert in case I ever do a top 10 auction games. We love, love, love this game. It's a really simple, straightforward uh, game where uh, you're playing these ancient civilizations, um, you know, in the, in the early days, uh, you know, trying to, you know, expand your land, expand your cities, give yourself new abilities, and you do that through a auction every round. And the thing that makes the auction work so well for a two-player game is that when you know, uh, when you have all the lots out in front of you, all the things you could get, all you know, the, the forests or the city upgrades or whatever, and you're trying to place a bid, you only get to make one bid. You can never raise your bid. So there's always this tension of, I really want that. 
Um, and I, so I could try to get it cheap, but if I put in a cheap bid, somebody will definitely outbid me and I won't get it. So I put in a heavy bid, but then what if nobody, what if I pay too much? Really, really great. We love this a lot. We've had great success showing this, you know, playing this with newbies as well. But for us, it's a fantastic game just to get out when we want to have a really solid, thinky, tense auction game. Pelephonies or Peloponies, as uh, Scott Nicholson once called it. Okay, on to the little shelf. Let's continue. Oh my goodness, San Juan. This is a very, very neat game. This is the this is officially the the card game for the highly acclaimed Puerto Rico, and it is an awesome card game. Although I have to admit, Jen and I maybe play this more on our iPhone than we do actually in the physical form anymore because there's an excellent iPhone app for this as well. But a really, really great card game about you know trying to build up your own little. Um, city in San Juan by playing cards and you do that, if you've got a card you really want to play, you've got a whole bunch of cards in your hand. They're all good. They all give you really great benefits. But to play the cards you really want, you have to discard other cards. And so there's always this tight, tight tension of, but I want to play all these cards. I don't want to get rid of these two cards to play this other card. Maybe I should play this other one. And you're always thinking about that. And it's just a fantastic game. We love it a lot. San Juan. Um, and you know, and you know, since San Juan and it's up there, Race for the Galaxy have come out. This is a me mechanism, a card mechanism that's uh, you know found itself in a lot more games. It's really, really brilliant, including the new Lewis and Clark that came out this year. But San Juan, we still enjoy the heck out of because it's so smooth and so fast and so satisfying. Ah, switching hands. All righty, jab. Real time boxing is very neat. This is a very, very cool game. It's real time. Basically, what you do is. Um, you have a deck of cards that represent your right hand and your left hand, and you are playing at 100% real time. You know, slapping down cards as fast as you can, going for uppercuts and haymakers, and you know, cross jabs and stuff like that. But both players are doing it at the same time. And what you're doing is, is you're slapping these cards down with your left hand or your right hand um, to try to you know punch your opponent, um, you know, on various parts of their body. You're looking. For, you're, 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 you don't know exactly what cards are coming, and you're looking to try to create patterns. Because if you create certain patterns, you can do super powerful moves. But your opponent, who is playing just as fast and as furious and is trying to create their own patterns, also has to watch to block your patterns. And so you're constantly building these patterns, trying to stop the other opponent. It's an incredibly clever game of both offense and defense. And people who say, oh, it's really simple in one note, you just, whoever plays fastest wins, they're really not under, understanding or appreciating the defense of this game. Game. Really clever, really imaginative game. We like it a lot. Uh, boxing real time. Mundus Novus is a very pretty, the art in this game is absolutely gorgeous. It is a card game of trade uh, in the new world and bringing those goods back to the old world. The core element of it is every turn you've got you, you get a bunch of cards and you know they're all they're coffee and and um, you know various goods from the new world cotton and all that. And um, everybody has to throw a certain number of cards in, you know, out into this kind of trading pot that then other players could grab. And so there's always this real tension of, well, which ones do I want to throw out even because I have to throw some of them out there and they might benefit somebody else if they end up getting them. But by the same token, somebody else might throw something I need. Very, very cool. Very clever game. Ah, my happy farm. This is a neat little game. Um, you know, I would almost, it's fun. It's a great game to play with kids because it's all about uh, you know, a card management game of growing seeds to grow crops so you can feed your cow, your pig, your sheep, and your bunny. And at the end of the game, whoever has done the best job feeding them so they're big and long and fat wins the game. There's no, um, you're not feeding them to uh, slaughter them or anything like that. In fact, actually, the rules go out of their way to have nice, economically friendly reasons. You, you're trying to get big pigs so they can dig up truffles for you. Um, you know, so there's never any of the, of the of the grim reality of why you're trying to fatten up these animals. But it's a really sweet, clever game that I think is fantastic for playing with kids. Um, you know, and so that's actually one of the reasons we keep it around in case there ever are folks and we need to have a game that we would play with them. My Happy Farm is guaranteed to win. But you know, Jen and I enjoy it too. We have played it just with adults, you know, newbies, you know, in the same way we would use for Ticket to Ride. And it works really well for that too. Um, you know, and also the other thing too, it's, there's a really, really compelling element of it. Let me see if it shows it. Um, like you can see, that bunny rabbit is negative five. He's kind of sad. That's because he hasn't been fed yet. When you eventually feed that bunny rabbit, you flip his card over, and then he's got a big, happy smile on his face. And it is so satisfying when you're, you start out the game looking at these four sad animals, but then you eventually feed them and they get happy. It's a, it's a simple little psychological trick that's wonderful. 
Roll Through the Ages. This was one of the first games that really got us into modern board gaming, and we still hold on to it. We love it. It's a dice rolling game uh, sent in the uh, ancient world as you are rolling Yahtzee style to collect resources to uh, build up your ancient civilization by pursuing several different things, special abilities, big old monuments and whatnot. It's really smooth. It's really solid. It comes with these big chunky wood pieces. This is actually a surprisingly heavy box. Like it a lot. We'll never get rid of it. Roll through the ages. Gauntlet is another game from Donald X Vaccarino that um, I think is a really tough game for some people to get their head around. At the core of it, it's a very, very cool system where basically you're about to go into a dungeon, but before you do, you, um, you know, there's these wizards and barbarians and monks and priests and ninjas and, um, you know, that you could take with you down into the dungeon. But you have to, you have this kind of betting gambling thing where um, you basically say, you know what? Well, my wizard, he could beat the dungeon standing on one foot. And then somebody else could say, oh yeah? Well, my uh, wizard could beat the dungeon skipping breakfast. And, you know, and, and stuff like that. And so you have this kind of um, one-upsman thing where you um, every time you you take these games because you're you're basically it's an auction you're bidding on everybody wants that wizard because he's really powerful and I'll say well you know if I took the wizard he could be able to beat the dungeon with one hand tied behind his back or blindfolded and you know and basically and so that's a raise and you say oh yeah well I see that I my guy I could do him with blindfolded and um, without breakfast or wh whatever they are and eventually somebody says well okay I can't beat that you take that wizard and so suddenly I've created a customized wizard in this auction that um, has all these negative defects and so everybody does this they you know they get their characters and then they go through the dungeon really really fast and everybody because they're all gonna die nobody's gonna make it out alive but we see which character made it the farthest and got the most uh, gold it's a very very clever game and I think people have a hard time with it because when you first get it out you look at these uh, these characters you're bidding on and they all seem really good and it's kind of hard to judge which one, what, what the strengths and weaknesses are relative to each other and what the impacts of these bids are going to be. And so it can give you the impression, I mean a lot of people when they play it say, well I, I just won't bid on it, you know, I, you know, I, I, you know, then they just take it straight and they don't understand how to bid it up to make it an interesting game. It's, it's really, really cool, but it's surprisingly hard. I think um, the writer of the manual really did this game a disservice by not including a tutorial or a bunch of helpful hints because they assume that, oh, you'll play this game a lot of times so you can start to appreciate the value of things. But people, when they start playing and they don't understand how to play it, they kind of get a, a sour taste. But we think it's very, very clever and deserves more attention than it gets. Rapa Nui. Rapa Nui is an awesome game. I'm pretty sure I've done a run, yeah, I've done a run through for this. It's a great, great game set on, um, you know, the Polynesian island of, oh, what's it called? Easter Island, where you're collecting resources to build, you know, the great heads of Easter Island. Really, really rock solid, brilliant card hand management game that we enjoy quite a bit. Uh, I can't recommend this one highly enough. One of our faves, one of our favorite card games. Speaking of which, here's another one of our favorite card games, Morels. This is a very, very sweet game, only for two players, that replicates going for a walk in the woods to find mushrooms and, um, you know, collecting uh, cooking paraphernalia, you know, uh, butter and, and uh, apple cider and, you know, getting frying pans to cook them up to have a delicious meal. It's a sweet, innocent, charming game with a fair amount of stuff to think about, and we like it a lot. Uh, Lahav, the inland port. This is a small portable get version of Lahav, and I am looking forward to it. But we've never actually gotten it to the table yet, so I can't really say anything about it. Really need to play this someday. Lost Cities. Okay, this is a very, very popular couples game. A lot of people get this game to play with their spouses, and in fact, you know. Um, um, as per that almost stereotype, the, that's why we have it because Jen loves this game a lot. It's a very, very simple card game. It could, you could almost play this game with just a standard deck of cards, although I don't think you have quite the right suits. Um, but it is, it's kind of a uh, press your luck slash card hand management game where you're constantly responding to what your opponent is doing. It's very, very clever, very simple, very elegant. Um, one of Reiner Knizia's most popular enduring designs, Lost Cities. This is a brand new game we haven't played it yet, uh, The Outcast Heroes. I'm really looking forward to it too because it really goes, it's, it's a simulation of the historical freedom fighters of Poland who basically went underground during the, uh, you know, the, uh, the Soviet occupation post World War II. And so, I mean, it has a really strong historical flavor to it. I think I expect to learn a bit about history in this game. And supposedly it's just a good solid game to play as well. Can't wait to, tour, can't wait to try it. 
Outcast Heroes. Okay, oh, 1955. This is basically the tiny card game version of, say, Twilight Struggle. This is mini Twilight Struggle. Because it's basically, oops, ah, sorry about that. It's the same, oh my gosh, we're not even halfway through this. Oh goodness, I gotta pick this up. It, it's the same basic setting, you know, it's the Cold War, and players are, uh, you can see the board right there, Play, there's um, six countries, I think, yeah, and pl one player is the Soviet Union, one player is America, and you're basically just pushing your influence cubes back and forth by playing certain cards at certain times. It really is a very simple, almost kind of abstract distillation of, of uh, Twilight Struggle. And then, you know, it's the same theme. You're kind of doing the same stuff, but without a lot of the, the flavor and without a lot of the depth. But it plays really fast. It's really simple. And Jen and I enjoy this a lot more than Twilight Struggle. We got rid of Twilight Struggle. We kept this because it's fun and simple and quick and, you know, doesn't outstay its welcome. All right, 1955. Ah, Hellas. This is a very neat game. This is one of the games that made us appreciate, hey, maybe we could enjoy some kind of conflict-laden war games if there's something interesting. And this one is very interesting. First of all, it's incredibly tiny. It has the smallest print for a war game ever. You can't really tell, but these miniatures, these little miniatures in here are so wee. In fact, actually, that's maybe one of the pro problems with the game. They're so tiny, they can fall over really easy. But basically, you spend this game, you first, you know, um, you... Uh, take turns expanding and building. You're, you're building this world, um, you know, of the, you know, of the Greek Isles and whatnot. And while you're doing that, you're also putting your troops down, both ship and ground troops. And you know, that's all pretty straightforward. But then you're also playing these these favor of the god cards that are so almost random and swingy that they can radically change the layout of the board every single turn. It's it's uh, you know, it's very tactical. It's very fast playing. We really enjoyed a lot, mostly because of how much excitement and energy those those big swingy god cards bring. And it's so tiny. It's a super wee little tiny war game. Very neat. Hellas. Uh, okay, Caesar and Cleopatra is another, this is very, very similar in a lot of ways to Lost Cities and what's the other one I talked about? Oh, Battle Line. Um, you know, in that this is basically another, well, this one's not from Reiner Kenichi, like the other ones. This is another card game where basically players sit opposite each other. There's a line between them and you take turns playing your cards to your side of the line, uh, trying to get Basically, you know, in, in Battle Line, it's trying to get certain almost kind of poker-like hands. In Lost Cities, it's just trying to get high numbers instead of low numbers. And in Caesar vs. Cleopatra, it's high levels and low numbers. But the big twist is you can play your cards face up or face down. So you're never really certain what cards your opponent has played on the other side of the line. So there's always a bit of risk and gamble to it and excitement. Neat game. Um, once again, back to the tiny Reiner Kenichia boxes. Reiner did this one, didn't he? Of course he did. He must have. Yes, he did. Yeah, this is actually a small two-player version of Medici, which is one of his um, you know, most widely regarded auction games. He did this series of auction games back in the day, and then they did this little small version of it. Very, very simple game. Um, you know, Jen and I, we don't really play it that much, but we, when we ever we do, we enjoy it. Really simple auction game. Not very much to say about it. Okay, moving on to something I do have more to say about. Agricola, all creatures great and small. This is the tiny two-player only box version of Agricola that strips out all the um, crops and lets you focus on building up your house and uh, breeding livestock. And it's very fun, very quick and play, fast to play. But I would suggest that if you're going to get this, know that you want to pick up at least one of the two expansions that have come out for it so that it has decent replay value. Without those, I think it could outstay its welcome. But with those expansions, this game gets excellent. Um, really, really enjoy this a lot. You know, really captures the Agricola feeling in a half an hour in a nice, small, portable package. All righty. Oddville. Oh, I recently got this. I really need to do a run-through for it. It's another game from What's Your Game, a really hot, up-and-coming European publisher that I don't think enough people are talking about because they just produce really fantastic stuff, as you'll see when I get to, to the uh, What's Your Game section in parts four. All right, but anyway, we're back in part two. I got to stand up. I'm, my knees are killing me now. All righty. So this is a city building game where you have these nice, these gorgeous, gorgeous art on these cards. As you're laying down, um, you know, building up this city, um, you know, a communal city. Both of us are playing the same city and paying attention to how roads connect to each other and um, trying to outdo each other by getting, you know, area control of the city. And there's actually some really, really cool, sweet mechanisms. It's kind of hard to describe. It'd be much better for me to do a run through. So I just need to do that. But in the meantime, no, we were really surprised. We like this game a lot. It's gorgeous. It's fast playing. It's tiny. And it gives you a lot to think about while playing. 
Okay, Cafe Melange. Got this at Essen, haven't played it yet. Um, don't really know much about it other than it is a game where I believe you are waiters in a cafe trying to seat um, you know, all your customers next to famous personages like Freud and, um, and Gustav Mahler and whatnot be, you know, because everybody wants to sit next to all the celebrities that are in your cafe. So it has like this really classy setting scenario which I think is really neat and I just like the idea of it. Um, because, well, I really, to be fair, I really liked the, the PC Flash game, Diner Dash. I thought that game was brilliant. And so I'm really kind of intrigued by the notion of the spatial gameplay of trying to seat the right people at the right dinner table. And so that's what it is. Haven't played it yet, but I'm really anticipating it. Citadels, this is a classic card game. Um, probably need to talk about it. Probably everybody knows about it. But basically, in this game, there are a bunch of roles. Uh, a king, an assassin, a priest, and whatnot. And every round, everybody gets one of those roles and it lets them do one thing special. But everybody draws their roles in secret. Nobody knows what everybody draws. Um, and so you have to... You know, pick wisely because one of the roles is an assassin, and whoever draws that gets to assassinate somebody else. So you might find, um, you know, if you grab the role that everybody wants, that you don't get to do it. It's a really, really clever game, and surprisingly, it works really well two players because in a two player game, we like it a lot because everybody, you know, in a two player game, you get to do two roles. So you have a lot more to think about. Very, very cool. It's one example of taking a something that you wouldn't think would work well for two players and make it work fantastically, maybe even better with two players because, as often as the case, when you get into a two player game, you have a lot more control, you have a lot more to think about, you have a lot more to plan. That's why we like Citadels. Pergamon is an excellent game. I've done a run through for this. Um, it's a, you know, basically go to the Pergamon dig site and dig deeper and deeper to find ancient artifacts and put them on display in a museum. And the cool thing about it is every, at the beginning of every round, there is going to be, it's represented by those cards there, a certain amount of money that's given as a grant to everybody who, you know, there's grant money to go out and excavate at Pergamon. But nobody knows exactly how much it's going to be. You only know roughly how much it's going to be. So everybody pushes their luck and takes a guess at it saying, well, you know what? I think it's going to be somewhere between 10 and 15 bucks. I'm going to ask for seven bucks. And then somebody else might say, oh yeah, well, I'm going to ask for five bucks. And that means they will get their five bucks before you get your seven bucks. So if you gamble that it's going to be a big grant, you want to you know, ask for a lot of money. But if it turns out to be a small grant, you'll end up holding nothing. So it's a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant push your luck game. Very, very cool. Pergamon. Uh, St. Malo and Glenmore and Alia Octa Est. Three wonderful Alia games. Uh, number five, six, and nine in the Alia medium box category. Let's go up in order. Number five. It's another game from Jeffrey Allers. I talked about him yesterday about Citrus. Excited about. Reason I'm so excited about Citrus is because we love this game. This is a game we've actually taken on vacations with us and gotten Muggles to play. It's just basically it's a whole bunch of very very colorful dice that you're rolling to do you know to basically try. Well, there's basically all these areas. There's the you know the temple, the you know the the Senate, all these different places that you can use your dice as kind of worker placement, sort of, or more like it's less worker placement, more area control. But there's different rules for every building of how you can kick somebody else out, whether you have to get higher numbers or you have to continue a sequence or whatever. And so it's really, really interactive in that you're constantly um, buffeting for space here. And it's a very sweet, colorful, fast playing game that we absolutely love. I am not doing it justice with that description, but we love this dice rolling, uh, Aaliyah Octias, which of course is Latin for the die is cast. Um, great, great game. And educational too. Okay, Glenn Moore, awesome game. This is the one, you know, Lancaster and Glenn Moore, both from designer Matthias Kramer, one of the best designers working today. He just produces really rock solid stuff. I've done a run through for this. I, I'm not going to be able to really sum up just how much we love it here, but suffice to say, it is an amazing game. Because basically you're um, on this kind of rondelle, trying to be the first to grab the tiles you want. Um, you know, taking big gambles of you know grabbing one that's way ahead, or you know, tr you know, playing conservatively or aggressively. But then once you get the tiles, you're putting them in your own little section of Glenmore, of you know, the Scottish Highlands. And whenever you put one tile next to another tile, that the new tile makes the old tile activate. So you have this really interesting puzzle as you're building up your area, trying to plan for the future to make sure everything works out really nicely. 
St. Malo is from the designer of Village, which is, you may know, is one of Jen's, well, one of my favorites. Jen liked it a lot too, but she had a really hard time playing because she gets too emotionally evolved to the, attached to the workers. This is a neat game because um, you use these uh, dry erase markers on this dry erase board to literally draw the um, the city castle that you're that you're working on. Everybody has their own little board, and you're rolling dice Yahtzee style to either get walls or soldiers or goods or whatnot, and then you literally draw them on the board. And now some people complain that oh, well, that's really crappy. This game should just come with a bunch of cubes and and pieces that represent, and you can put them out there. That defeats the purpose. The beauty of this game is you could play this anywhere. You could play this in the back seat of a car. You could play this, you know, um, you know, in a bus stop. You could play this on a windy day because everything is just these dice, this dry erase board, and this marker. It's so brilliant. We like, you know, it, it, the game is okay, but what's brilliant is the components that make this a game you can play anywhere under any circumstance with anybody. Great, great game. A spectaculum. Okay, I'm almost done. I gotta speed this up. Done a run through for that. Check out the run through. Uh, kind of a uh, uh, last year, Rainer Kanichi put out a couple of new games, and this is a really, really great game that is loosely themed on traveling carnivals. But what it really is is a stock market. Um, uh, speculation game where you want to buy low and sell high because you're buying share. Okay. Well, it's basically a, a buy low, sell high shares game and it's brilliant. It works really, really well with two players. Really um, replicates the volatility of the market and even though the theme is so loosely tied, it's almost ridiculous of trying to you know, take a stock market simulation and put um, you know, carnival workers in it. It's still, it's very charming. The art is very charming, and you do find yourself playing, um, kind of, you know, going with the fiction of, okay, I'm just not investing in stocks, I'm investing in this carnival, and please go to the right town that will increase your value and whatnot. Very cool game. Radis, we've had this for a while. Oh my gosh, this box is heavy because I've got like five expansions worth of stuff in here. It's a very neat area control game where you're using your cubes, moving them around um, all over Europe and trying to avoid the Black Plague, um, which is represented by this big, you know, kind of grim reaper marker that moves around. And, you know, there's all these tokens that you don't know exactly what they say until you flip them. And if they're rats, you know, or, you know, depending on what they are, they could, if you're, if you're in that area, they could kill a lot of your population. So you can, you're trying to shuffle your population around so that your, your opponent is the one who gets hit by the Black Plague uh, spread by all those rats. Neat game, fast, fun, solid. Veluspa, haven't played this yet. Apparently it looks really, really neat. It's a tile land game with a lot of neat tactics. Don't know much about it yet, looking forward to it. King and Assassins, this is one of the games I was definitely most excited about at Essen 2013. And unfortunately I haven't played it yet, but it's a two player game where one player plays the king, the evil king that everybody hates. The other player plays a bunch of assassins who are trying to kill him. And what's happening is you've got this um, town square. The king is just trying to get through the square to get back to the castle. And there's almost a riot going on and all these villagers moving around. So the king uses his knights to push people away so he can get to the castle. But hidden amongst all the rabble that are in the almost riot, there are assassins controlled by the other player. So the other player is trying to move around without being discovered so they can assassinate the king. Brilliant idea. I cannot wait to try this. I really need to play this soon. I'm so excited about it. And Metallum is from the same publisher. I mostly got it. I mean, it seems neat too, but I mostly got it because it was, it was uh, kind of two for one. Hey, I'm getting King Assassin. Might as well get this too. Uh, it seems like a really, really neat game of interstellar mining. And, oh, I can't remember why I liked it so much. What it was that was cool about it. It's a two-player game, so it focuses on that. But I, I just need to play it soon. But most of I got it because I was super excited about King of But I, I wouldn't be surprised if this is good too. Although I haven't tried either of them yet, so I'm jumping the gun. Craftsman, don't know anything about this. I ended up getting it in part because um, my Rado Run Through voters asked for, make, to make sure that I get it at Essen this year. And so I did. I know nothing about this game. Um, so I'm looking forward to it. Can't say anything more. Florence of the Card Game. Uh, actually, I picked up Florenza 2, haven't played yet, but this is a neat, solid game, um, really rock solid, very straightforward Euro mechanisms of, you know, trying to build um, grand palaces and works of art by hiring the right artists and getting the right resources. Um, you know, nothing really revolutionary, just rock solid and simple and smooth and fast playing and fun. Phantom of the Opera. Oh, we like this a lot. This is basically a re-implementation of Mr. Jack, which is a two-player game of um, bluffing and deduction. Um, and, you know, the original game we had and liked, but we got rid of because Jen hated the notion of playing as Jack the Ripper and helping Jack the Ripper escape, so she hated the theme. But now that you're helping the Phantom of the Opera, she doesn't mind so much. Basically, there's an opera house. The Phantom of the Opera is 
one of several different characters. Nobody knows who the Phantom is, and so, um, well, you know, the Phantom knows who he is, and he's trying to keep his identity um, concealed from the other player, and the other player is trying to figure it out, and both players can control all these characters as you move around and try to outwit each other before time runs out. Brilliant one. Cannot wait to do a run-through for this. Oop, that's upside down. Phantom of the Opera. Okay. Briefcase, another game from Artipia over here. Neat, neat worker placement game. I believe it's the first worker placement game. I'm sorry, not worker placement, deck building. It's the first deck building game that adds to the standard deck, D Dominion deck building formula the notion of gathering resources, collecting resources, and paying them off. And you know, and plus it has a really nice theme of um, building big modern industries. So neat game, solid, really brings something new and interesting to deck building. Shadows of the Empire, this is a very, very cool game. I've done a run through for it. And it's all about this big field of these gigantic cards, and you're trying that represent all these characters in this royal court, and you're trying to spread your influence amongst them. It's very fast, incredibly tactical, incredibly deep and heavy. That's what's interesting about this game. This is probably the fastest playing deep, heavy game we've got. Um, but the only problem with it for Jen was it's so deep and it's so heavy and so tactical. This gave her a really bad case of analysis paralysis. So. I'm not sure if we're keeping it or not, but we really respect the hell out of it, and I liked it a lot. You just need to make sure if you're going to play it with somebody, it's with somebody who doesn't get bogged down with five billion things to choose between. St. Petersburg, neat, neat um, card game set in Russia as you are basically hiring. Um, oh, it's a pretty straightforward. Ah, oop, and as you can see, this is the shelf. I should not be pulling these things out from this shelf. This is the shelf where nothing fits. It's a really nice, uh, rock solid. Standard Euro game. Um, we, the main thing about it is it has one of those really, it's one of those games that has a great sense of escalation. You know, at the beginning of the game, you're a schlub, you can barely do anything. By the end of the game, you're doing big, massive real estate deals and shifting tons of money. And so you get a really great sense of satisfaction as you go from zero to hero in St. Petersburg. Uh, the Hanging Gardens, uh, which I have a German version of, is a neat little uh, spatial puzzle game. You have all these cards, like here's one, that have, I mean, you're basically, you're building the, the, the ancient um, wonder, the Hanging Gardens. And you've got all these different garden features on these cards and you know they have blank spaces and not and you know what you have a hand of cards in your hand and you're playing them on top of each other to create I you can't quite see this patchwork of different cards so you can see how there's that card and then this card got um, put on top of it so the, there's like that little set of blues and that little set of pinks and that little set um, because that was a really good mix and match of three different cards so it's a really interesting thinky puzzle game uh, not very many people know about it. It's a really nice unsung gem. We think it's really, really neat. Draco, I talked about this in my top 10 fantasy games. Really, really cool asymmetric battle with three dwarves fighting one wounded dragon on a very, very small battlefield using action cards. We like it a lot. Very cool, very fast playing. When we play it, we normally, um, I'll play as the dwarves and then I'll play as the dragons. You know, we switch roles. Great. Artists, very, this is a real mind screw of a game because uh, it's, um, oh, basically, what do you call it? Musical chairs. Uh, everybody's sitting around the round table in, um, you know, King Arthur's Camelot. And uh, what happens is everybody wants to sit next to the king. So you're trying to move, you have several different guys of your color, of, the, of your pawns, and you're trying to move them around to get closer to, the, to whoever's currently the king, which is represented by those rings, or, you know, a higher up in nobility. Everybody wants to sit close to them. Um, but what keeps happening is, you can see that pig, you you grab that pig and you spin the table. So the value of all the spaces around the table is constantly shifting. It is a ridiculously complex, fast moving, tactical game of, like I said, musical chairs. Very neat game. Uh, uh, Mykaranos, or uh, Mykaranos, I'm not quite sure how to pronounce it. It's another neat game of uh, you know ancient Egypt ex, uh, ex excavation type stuff, uh, which is an area control thing where you've got special abilities with certain characters. Nice, straightforward game. We like it. We enjoy it. Good, fun game. I should do a run through for it someday, I assume. Spirium haven't played it yet. The uh, latest game or the first new heavy game from William Attia, who was the designer of Kalos, and therefore arguably one of the fathers of modern heavy Euro board games. And supposedly this is very, very cool. Can't wait to give it a try. Race for the Galaxy. I already talked about San Juan. Race for the Galaxy is basically the science fiction version of San Juan with about 10 times the complexity. And it's awesome. Enough said. Nefarious. Uh, another from designer Donald X. Vaccarino. He of 
Dominion fame. And this is going to be hard for you to find because it was published and then the publisher went out of business. And so far, so there are very few copies of this in the world. We're lucky to have one, the Mad Scientist game. Although my, I hear Donald X. Vaccarino has said that there are plans in the works to get a new publisher to get the rights to it so it can be republished. It's a really simple, fast playing game. And like all Donald X. Vaccarino games, its main thing is that every time you play, well, every time you play, you're a mad scientist and you're trying to pursue mad goals through uh, speculation, inventions, research, and workers. You have workers that you place on all these different actions and you're trying to build um, anti-gravity suits and secret layers and time machines and all that. But the thing is, every time you play, there's going to be two twists, random cards that change the rules of the game. Like it could be at the start of each round, everybody gets extra money because mad scientists, there's a chat circuit. So everybody has a lot more money than normal or um, you know, certain actions get turned off or can't be done. And you know, the first time we played, we thought, ah, yeah, that was okay. Yeah, not, not really that big a deal. But then this, um, we played it one more time and got two different twist cards, and suddenly the game was radically different. And then we played a third time and it was radically different again. And you know, so over time you start to get this really great sense of, I can't wait to see what this game will throw at us next because the rule, the core rules are so simple and every time you play it's so different. Um, if, it, if it played the same every single time, I don't think we'd stick with it. But what it's, it's always the surprise of new combinations that brings us back to Nefarious. Space Mission, um, I've got this in a math trade, I've never really played it yet, don't really know if it's any good or not. Um, haven't even played it yet, I've had her quite a while. Somebody tell me, is Space Mission good? Should we play it? I don't know. Almost done, folks, 50 minutes. Oh, pulling these boxes out is killing me. But okay, let's, we're almost done. Reiner Knizia Samurai. I'm not gonna pull these out, these are too hard to get. There's lots of pictures you can see online. This is a very, very cool, very clever, very elegant area control game where you're trying to anticipate what your player is gonna do and take over ancient Japan. Uh, we like it, the pieces are gorgeous. It has this really great, elegant, sophisticated look to it and it's um, very thinky. Very smart game. Stronghold, I've done a run through for this. This is an awesome asymmetrical. One player controls a big, it, this is like recreates the Battle for Helm's Deep from, um, uh, from the Lord of the Rings films, where one person controls the castle and the other person controls the rampaging armies of orcs and trolls. It's incredibly deep, incredibly heavy, and very fun, very satisfying. Also very fiddly, a lot of little pieces, a lot of stuff to keep track of, but a great, great experience. I've done a run through for it. Lords of Waterdeep I've done a run for. Uh, great, great um, gateway game. If you have friends in your life who love um, World of Warcraft or Baldur's Gate or video games set in a fantasy universe and you are having a hard time getting them to try and play a board game with you, bring this out. This will convert fantasy geeks into board game geeks. It's that good and that's what it's good at. It's amazing. Darkest Night, I haven't played it yet. Um, looking forward to it soon. Had this sent over from America. Very, very thankful because one of my watchers basically volunteered to send over so I really need to get this to the table quick. Apparently it's a very, very neat, exciting, cooperative, fantasy card or you know uh, save the world game that's all I know it got a lot of buzz a lot of people are very excited about it can't wait to give it a go glory to Rome great really clever one of the best um, you know modern euro style card games there are out there um, hard to get because it's kind of out of print but well worth seeking out I've done a run through for it you can see that yeah, I just need to stop talking about that. I can see you say, I've done a run through, you can watch that. That'll get me through these faster, won't it? But I'm almost done now. CV, I picked it up at Essen. Don't know much about it. I like the idea of it in that you're playing cards like, oh, what is it? Uh, a top student, married, uh, a blood donor, a CEO. Basically, you're, you have a hand of cards and you're trying to control them to build the ultimate CV or resume for uh, my American viewers who don't know what CV is. That's a very European term. Um, and it looks really, really cool. I'll be honest though, the reason I picked this up at Essen is because when you bought this, you got a for free, a really big cloth bag that was a lifesaver for me carrying around all the games I was getting at the show. So that's why I got it, but I'm, I'm looking forward to it. I hope it's great. Castle Pan we love this game. It's so cool. It's a very, very clever uh, game where you have this castle at the center and every turn orcs and goblins 
and trolls are rushing in from the forest to um, to a spot where archers can shoot them, and then knights can run out and get them, and then swordsmen can get them, and if you don't get them, they'll destroy your castle. And everybody's working cooperatively by trading cards. The only problem with it is, it's way too easy. This suffers from the semi-co-op plague that so many semi-co-ops do, where, you know what, if you play semi-cooperatively, because what happens is, basically in this game, we have to trade cards. If I've got an archer card and you need it, I should give it to you and get something else. And of course I'll do that, because we want to win, right? No, I won't, because maybe I want to hold on to that archer card so that on my turn I can play it and I can score points. Whereas if I give the archer card to you, then you will score points. So there's this whole semi-cooperative element of it that's supposed to create this tension of sometimes you work together, sometimes you're selfish because you all want to win. And as soon as you say, well, let's ignore that. Let's ignore the semi-co-op and always do the right thing. This game becomes so painfully easy, so brain-dead simple, that there's no challenge to it whatsoever and becomes a little bit boring. And so that's a problem. It's the same problem that Castaways has. There's nothing wrong with semi-co-op unless you don't want to play that way. Because then, without the tension of semi-co-op, it becomes too easy when you play fully co-op. Now, this game does have an expansion, though. And I do have the expansion in here. I haven't played with the expansion yet. And supposedly, that adds so much challenge and difficulty that that solves it and makes it a good, solid, challenging, regular co-op game if you want to ignore the semi-co-op. So I'm looking forward to that. That's Castle Panic. Um, Preda Porter is an awesome, awesome, super, this is a very deep, heavy worker placement game that replicates the uh, economics behind running, it's, it's not a particularly exciting um, presentation, but this is all about running a fashion company where you hire the hottest upcoming fashion designers and, um, you know, and, 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 and PR reps and models and stuff like that because you're running a fashion agency and you're getting ready for, because four times over the course of the game, there will be these four big fashion shows in Milan and Paris and, and um, you know, in New York and whatnot. And so you have several rounds to get ready, get all the resources in place, get the right employees while still running a business and trying not to go out, you know, get broke or anything. It's a brilliant, brilliant game. And it's, this game breaks my heart. Because all heavy Euro game economic fans should play this, but so many people refuse to play it because they say it's a girly theme because it's the, about the economics of running a fashion agency. Now this could have been about running a video game developer or a car manufacturer or an ad agency. This could have been about anything. They just chose fashion. Um, and it's really about the economics of running a successful creative industry business. And if you look at it that way, um, you know, just you know, if you don't like the fashion, just ignore that and pretend it's about you know because all creative industries are you know it's it's always about the the raw the, the the friction between the creative you know trying to come up with you know genius and get the right people in the right place with the right equipment and the right um, resources to make something brilliant and then show it at a at a show. It's so good. We love this game so much, and I really wish there was something I could do to get more, convince more people they should give it a try. If you don't like the theme, you're a fool. It doesn't matter. Play it because it's a rock solid, awesome worker placement, heavy economic simulation. And finally, we're done, folks, at an hour. Alien Frontiers. Now, I already talked a bit about Dark Horses down there. The Dark Horse, which is a dice placement worker, uh, you know, dice worker placement game where you roll your dice and you place them as workers to do certain things. This is the same basic idea, but in space, where um, instead of you know conquering the old west, you're conquering this um, you know science fiction planet and getting special abilities depending on what areas you do. There's a lot of, of uh, similarities between the two games. The reason we like Dark Horse more, and we you know we love this game. It's a really really great game. We really respect it. The problem with this game is this is a mean, nasty, cutthroat game where players are constantly stealing from each other, constantly punching each other in the face. It's just. Oh, really, it's it's a knife fight, is what this game is with dice, um, and so you know we we kind of have mixed feelings about. It. We enjoy it, we respect it. It's a lot of fun to think about, but God, you're just constantly punch, 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 punching everybody else in the face and hoping not to get punched in the face yourself. And that's why we like Dark Horse better because it's just as deep, just as rich, but it takes out all the mean, nasty stuff. Okay, folks, that was it. Part two, I think this took quite a bit longer than part one. That's because I kept pulling the boxes out. Tell me, would you rather me be longer and pull the boxes out um, and take twice as long? Or for part three, would you rather me go back to the way I did part one and 
and just point at the box, describe it and move on and do it in half the time. I will let you guys tell me before I start working on uh, step number three. Um, in the meantime, I think I'm going to be done here. It's very, very dark. I hope this actually shows up. As you can see, it is now nighttime because I've been going for quite a while. Sorry, Francis Drake. Maybe tomorrow. Okay, folks. Oh, hi, Tula. Tula, how you doing? Oh, so late. Tula is very sleepy. Okay, folks. Sorry, you did not tune in to watch a sleeping beagle. I'm done here for the night. I'm gonna upload this. Talk to y'all later. Again, let me know. Do you prefer the longer showing the boxes, talking in more depth, or do you prefer the shorter, just quickie one, two sentence approach as I do the other ones? Your call. Uh, talk to you later. Have a good day. Oh, bye bye.